This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Stephen Cook, who is the Hasib J. Sabah Senior Fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. His new book is The Struggle for Egypt from Nasser to Tahrir Square. Stephen, welcome back to our program. Great pleasure to be back. Uh, how long did it take you to write the book, and when did you finish it? Well, from the time I sat down to actually write to the time I finished, uh, the first draft was exactly a year. Um, obviously, I spent a lot of time beforehand doing research for the book. I finished the first draft on January 17, 2011, eight days before the Egyptian uprising began. But uh, oh, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead, no, no, but I, I, the, the, the real final product was finished by February 2011. And, was published this October, past and what, October. What was your goal in writing the book? Well, for me, writing is a problem-solving exercise. And my first book, Ruling But Not Governing, which I think we talked about four years ago, was in part about Egypt, about the military in Egypt. And I really had a lot of questions about Egypt and Egyptian politics and the U.S.-Egypt relationship uh, coming out of that book. And I thought that it would be a, a terrific intellectual exercise to write a big book about uh, Egyptian history and Egyptian politics, which would teach me the things that I thought I didn't know, and in fact, I didn't know. And also, uh, there hadn't been a book like this uh, about Egypt for quite some time. I, I think in 25 years, there'd been a ton of things written on Egypt, very kind of specific uh, academic work, tremendously uh, useful academic work on particular aspects of Egyptian politics, but not a big book on the kind of arc about Egyptian history and politics, which is what um, I ended up writing in The Struggle for Egypt. And, and why is it important to write this kind of history? In, in what way does does it provide a context for what we're seeing on the news, which is what happened here? Well, indeed, in, in, in some ways, I'm, I was quite thankful for the, for the uprising because it, it, it provided a nice arc to my historical narrative. Um, the whole idea behind the book is that Egypt has long been more contested in, in an ideologically richer place than people had given credit. Uh, over the last decade or more, there had been this kind of two-dimensional view of Egyptian politics was between the regime and the brotherhood. But there are other groups that were out there who were engaged in politics, engaged in discussion about uh, what uh, ailed Egyptian society. And so I think that the book kind of pulls it all together in, in a historical way, that what we're seeing, or what we saw on January 25th, 2011, and what we've been seeing uh, since Mubarak's fall has historical precedent in other periods of great uh, upheaval in Egypt, whether it's the 1919 nationalist revolution, whether it's the period before or immediately after the Free Officers' Coup in 1952. The 19, February 1968 uprising, not many people know that Egyptian students occupied Tahrir Square for five days in February 1968. Um, that was ostensibly about the light sentences that the Egyptian Air Force officers uh, received um, in a trial uh, related to their responsibility for the June 67 defeat. But in fact, what these students wanted was to live in a more democratic and, and open Egypt. Uh, there was a similar kind of uprising in 72. So um, what happened on January 25th of last year uh, was not without uh, precedent in Egyptian politics. And many of the themes that have come out over the course of the last year are themes that have animated Egyptian politics for the better part of the last century, if not more. And, and uh, what would you say are the central themes? I will walk you through, you know, the different actors in a, in a few minutes, but, but are, are, what are the central themes that emerged after you went back and did this history? Uh, social justice, 
uh, more representative government and freedom from foreign domination. And I think that those things were important in the late 19th and early 20th century and remain important at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, Egyptians didn't rise up because any country occupied them, but the U.S.-Egypt relationship was one that many Egyptians were quite uncomfortable with. Um, in terms of social justice, uh, the, the social contract between Egyptians and the Egyptian government was frayed, if not torn asunder, uh, by the time of the late Mubarak period. And certainly, Egypt was not, uh, did not feature a representative government. So um, all of these things, these, these struggles for these, to achieve these goals, um, are as relevant today as they were uh, 100 or so years ago. What, what surprised you most as you went back and looked at this history? Well, I indeed, uh, what surprised me most were the parallels, were that these themes lived on, um, that the questions uh, that Egyptians have been asking, the kind of key identity questions that Egyptians have been asking for a long time, are the same questions that they're asking now and that have not been, uh, that have not to date been resolved. And I think it's important for Egyptians to uh, answer questions about what kind of society they want, what kind of government they want, what Egypt's place is in the region, what it stands for. Uh, it, they have to answer those questions uh, in, in order to have a, a, a more stable political system, one that, that there is general agreement about. Uh, as I re read the book, I, I jotted in, in my notes, the more things change, the more they remain the same. So this is a story about uh, stagnation, inertia, stasis. Is, is that a fair reading? Well, in, in one sense it is, in that the uh, free officers regime which is essentially the same regime that President Mubarak presided over until last February, um, uh, ceased to be dynamic. Uh, and what Mubarak and, and the military, which is now in control of Egypt, became defenders of an increasingly illegitimate status quo. Uh, so the regime itself remained essentially the same. Of course, there were some critical changes and so on and so forth, but Egypt had stagnated. But the politics were very dynamic. This is a, a society that was, has been mobilized and that people were searching for answers to those identity questions that I, I, I just uh, enumerated, that uh, we're looking for a different vision of Egyptian society, a, a different formulation for what kind of government uh, Egyptians should have. So there was a, a rather robust debate going on under this authoritarian system about the kind of Egypt that Egyptians want, what they definitely didn't want any longer was Mubarak's Egypt, or the Egypt of the free officers. Uh, talk about the free officers' uh, uh, ouster of the previous regime, their taking of power, and uh, the reasons you see that their revolution, in quotes, never took off. Well, uh, the, the free officers uh, came to power in July 1952 through a, a coup d'etat ostensibly because they were repulsed by the corruption of the monarchy, the foreign domination uh, in the form of the British occupation and subsequent uh, continued influence over uh, Egyptian politics, and the fact that there was no social justice, uh, although uh, the free officers, many of them were middle or even of upper middle class origins, they created this myth about being from kind of more hard scrabble, modest backgrounds. Um, but. In truth, when they came to power, they didn't really have an idea about how to go about doing this. They sort of made it up as they went along. And at first, they, start, they talked about a reform of the system. And then when they couldn't get uh, other important political actors, the Muslim Brotherhood at the time, or labor, or the existing political parties at the time, to kind of go along with them, uh, they started talking more about creating a new regime. And in that sense, it was ultimately a revolution in that they undermined both the political and social institutions of, uh, uh, of the monarchy. But again, they created something new that was, in response to the opposition that they encountered, an authoritarian political system that lacked in many ways, except for a short period of time, social justice or uh, the kind of international influence and power that Egyptians had sought and believed was their natural right as the inheritors of a great civilization. Uh, and uh, they didn't, uh, they, 
Egypt was no more of a democracy under the free officers in Nasser than it was under King Farouk and the monarchy. What, what is your sense of why Israel, I'm uh, sorry, Israel, Egypt never took off, uh, you know, uh, after the officers revolt? Was it a lack of it ideology? Was it the, the opposition? Uh, in the society was too entrenched? Was it uh, uh, the, the, the remnants of tribal and family loyalties? Well, in, in one way, if you look at it one way and you look at one period of time, uh, roughly between the nationalization of the Suez Canal in 1956 and the June 67 war, uh, the free officers of Egypt did take off. Nasserism, the, the, the principles of Nasserism, uh, and the objective reality that many Egyptians were experiencing were pretty close. There was expanded economic opportunity, expanded educational opportunity, a sense of Egyptians imp Egypt's important place in the world. Nasser was an important figure in, in the non-aligned movement, and uh, Egyptian foreign policy at the time was referred to as positive neutralism, which the Egyptians tried to play the great powers off of each other to get the things uh, that it wanted. Um, of course, there was always this lacking sense of representative government was lacking, but on other critical axes of what uh, Egyptians wanted, it seemed that Nasserism was delivering. And then came the 67 defeat, which revealed uh, the, the regime's claims actually to be quite hollow. Uh, Egypt was not a powerful country. It was smashed really not in six days. It was three days when the Israelis appeared on the east bank of the Suez Canal, uh, that um, Egyptians were being asked to give up personal and political freedoms, which they had wanted for a regime that wasn't necessarily delivering. Um, and uh, that led, ultimately, to skip a few years after Nasser's uh, death in 1970, to the Sadat period. And Sadat tried to correct what he believed to be the mistakes or the excesses of the Nasser period. And he talked about a state of institutions, which was code for a more democratic Egypt. He uh, pursued uh, economic reform, uh, what people refer to in Arabic as infita, economic opening. And he ultimately reoriented Egyptian foreign policy toward the West and strategic alignment with uh, the United States. By the end of Sadat's rule, on the eve of his assassination, e Egypt was not a democracy. Uh, only the very few were prosperous. And the realignment with the United States didn't make sense in terms of Egyptian nationalism. Egyptian nationalism ha was a response to the domination of Egypt by the West, in particular the British, and it didn't make sense that now Sadat, only not too long after the upper, within two decades, was now uh, was now aligning Egypt firmly with the West, in particular the United States. This this evolution from Nasser to Sadat to Mubarak uh, leads to the creation in, in Egypt of, of a military plutocracy, really, and uh, and I noted that the military seemed more interested in contracts than battles. Talk a little about that, because that that is the entrenchment of a regime uh, that, that can't move beyond uh, uh, where it's at and, and try to change the society. Well, in fact, the, the, the regime that many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Egyptians, and I'm sure it was millions of Egyptians, rose up against in January and February 2011 was the military regime that came into being in the, in the 1950s with the free officers. Uh, and this, uh, they had always been uh, a military officer at the pinnacle of the regime in the form of uh, the president, even though there is no formal linkage between the presidency and the e Egyptian armed forces. And this was a regime that was built in response to the challenges that the military confronted in the early 1950s in trying to consolidate its power. And as a result, these institutions reflected the interests of the military. And Nasser, Sadat, Mubarak, as military officers, first and foremost, thought about 
protecting uh, their interests and the and the interests of uh, of the Egyptian armed forces. Over time, uh, and beginning really in in the 1970s, the military uh, developed uh, robust economic interests, uh, and it is one of the key things that they are are looking after in post uh, Mubarak Egypt is to ensure that their uh, rather uh, well-developed uh, economic interests uh, remain outside uh, the public light um, and that they continue to do business as they always have done uh, with um, subsidized inputs into their businesses uh, that help support not only the uh, Egyptian armed forces but uh, military officers themselves. So, so we're really talking about military ink. Uh, essentially, a military conglomerate that owns a, an array of businesses uh, and has a stranglehold on the Egyptian economy. Well, I wouldn't necessarily call it a stranglehold, but there certainly are um, uh, certainly the, the industries and the companies that the military controls are, as I said, outside public view. They're not subject to parliamentary oversight, yet they enjoy the benefits of uh, a range of subsidies, and of course, they are. Uh, uh, arguably public because they are controlled uh, by the military. Now, the Egyptian private sector has grown exponentially over the course of the last 10 or 15 years, but this big chunk of the economy remains beyond the bounds of any civilian leaders, and the military would like to keep it that way. And what sort of what sort of products are we talking about? Well, uh, if you We're go to Egypt, we not talking just about billet, bullets and guns, right? Uh, if you go to Egypt, Harry, and you uh, buy a bottle of Safi spring water, you are contributing to the military's bottom line. Uh, if Egyptians uh, buy a certain brand of uh, kitchen equipment, ovens, and so on and so forth, they're contributing to the military's bottom line. Uh, when your plane is is fueled at an airport in Egypt, it's the likelihood. Is that a military aviation services, a military owned aviation services company is doing that uh, refueling and on and on and on and on and on. Even this um, big annual, biannual military exercise that the United States and the Egyptians put on with as many as 15 or 16 other countries is a big money making enterprise for, uh, for the Egyptian armed forces. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, 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 during this period, what uh, does the Egyptian military's capacity to fight wars remain at a high level? I don't think so at all. Uh, the, the, there's no evidence um, that it's, um, uh, the Egyptian armed forces is proficient at fighting. Um, they um, don't use the equipment uh, that they have uh, purchased from the United States uh, with a tremendous amount of efficiency. They don't use them correctly. For example, uh, Egyptians have M1A1 tanks, which they use as set battlefield pieces. Well, that's a waste of technology. Um, M1A1 tanks are supposed to be for maneuver warfare, but they don't know how to service the tanks. They don't, can't do the logistics for tanks operating over long periods of time. Uh, Egyptian military pilots are not known for their proficiency. Uh, certainly, they can take off and they can land. But in terms of uh, other kinds of skills, um, they are not uh, as proficient as, as others. Um, this is not uh, a, a significant fighting force. This is a, a, a military that is involved in economics and uh, its own economic interests and maintaining control over the Egyptian population. So, in a way, the, the, the result of policies uh, and relations both uh, uh, with the Soviet Union in the first period and then with the United States really was about putting the military to sleep. Really? Well, I, I wouldn't say so much during the Soviet period. Remember, uh, during the time that the Egyptians had a Soviet-equipped military, they achieved the greatest uh, military achievement in modern Egyptian history, the crossing of the Suez Canal in the opening uh, phase of the October 1973 war. Um, they didn't do so well after that heavily scripted crossing. Uh, which suggested that there were, were problems there in, in war fighting. But since then, um, when the United States and Egypt uh, entered into this strategic relationship and a, uh, the foreign military aid to Egypt from the United States began in the early 1980s, uh, the goal was to make over the Egyptian armed forces into a, an American-equipped force, a more effective fighting force. But in fact, over the course of 35 years, essentially, uh, the aid program has uh, demobilized the Egyptians as a fighting force. That has had unintended consequences for Egyptian politics and the Egyptian economy. 
um, which Egyptians are experiencing right now, but um, it is not a, an effective fighting force. And with regard to internal security during this period we're talking about, uh, what has been the dynamic there? The, the military has relied on the, the, the in general intelligence services to keep order when disturbances would periodically emerge? Well, uh, the military has always been allergic to the idea of the military itself playing a role in keeping Egypt's streets quiet. That was uh, something that was better left in the Ministry of Interior and the internal security services, the police and state security investigations. Uh, but they have been forced as a result of the uprising and that the police having been smashed during the uprising to take a more direct role in the policing of uh, Egypt's streets. There is institutional rivalries between the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Interior and the General Intelligence Service. Um, all uh, approach internal security from uh, a, a different perspective. Like I said, the, mi the Ministry of Defense doesn't really want to do this job. Uh, otherwise, they would abolish the Ministry of Interior, which Egyptians hate because of the, 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 the reputation for brutality uh, on, on the part of the police in the Ministry uh, of Interior. And the General Intelligence Service has a different function from these two other organizations. And, and I read uh, in, in an article, I guess, in the Financial Times that there are 165,000 Baltagia thugs employed by the former regime. So, so the, this was a, an array of, uh, of instruments of coercion, you would call it. Indeed. Uh, the Ministry of Interior uh, has uh, what plain clothes thugs, known as the Beltagia, who uh, were involved uh, in trying to quell the uprising and since have been uh, deeply involved in uh, trying to smash the revolutionary groups and uh, engaged in street battles with, uh, with demonstrators and, and protesters. Uh, one of the um, darker episodes and periods, uh, and, and darker things that emerged from the use of these plainclothes thugs is the sexual harassment and sexual abuse of women during the uprising. It had previously been re reserved for Egyptian women, and in particular Egyptian journalists during the, the 2000s, uh, during other uh, times of protest. Um, we saw it during the uprising, unfortunately, happened to the CBS News correspondent, Larry Logan. Uh, this is directly attributable to the Ministry of Interior and these plainclothes policemen that known as the Beltagia. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, what, as, as we move to the, the, the uprising uh, in the recent period, uh, what is this military council that has taken over? Mubarak falls from power. What is, what is your sense of the dynamic in that group? Are all of these security agencies uh, represented on the, the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces? Uh, what, what, who, who assumes leadership? Is it an institutional leadership, or is it a particular officer who rose in the way Sadat and Mubarak rose? Well, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces existed prior to the uprising um, as the Supreme Council to offer its advice and views on various issues related to national security and defense policy. Uh, it has changed, obviously, since the uprising. It is made up solely of military officers. Uh, it is led by Field Marshal Tantawi, the Minister of Defense. Uh, and his deputy is Lieutenant General Sami Anan, the chief of staff of the Egyptian Armed Forces. Uh, that group has been largely cohesive, and there has been a, a unity of command. There has not been a public falling out among uh, these officers, although just today uh, they replaced uh, the general in charge of propaganda and morale uh, on the SCAF and appointed someone else. That in it of itself is, is not an indicator that uh, the military is starting to crack. What uh, the military has been concerned about, though, has been what lower ranks would do. And almost everything that they did during the uprising and since then has been to ensure that the unity of command remains and that the organization itself remains a cohesive organization. And so they will not hold responsible 
younger officers for outrages that happen on the streets of Egypt, like beating up young women uh, protesters. You may have heard about the Blue Bra Girl, uh, this woman whose uh, whose clothing was was ripped off, and she revealed that she was wearing a, a blue bra, but, but she was be beaten, beaten yeah. terribly, yeah. terribly by the military police, um, because the military is concerned uh, that uh, they not break. Uh, the armed forces in the process of administering transitional Egypt. Is it the case now, as we read the papers, given this the structure that you've outlined, that sometimes the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing? Well, indeed. Uh, certainly the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces is the, holds executive authority, uh, but it is not an evil genius uh, uh, collectively pulling uh, and uh, levers and pulleys and manipulating everybody. Certainly there has been efforts uh, to do that, but uh, the officers have also revealed themselves to be serial bunglers, uh, have made uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous mistakes over the course of uh, the last uh, year or so. And um, the rivalries between the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry of Defense and the General Intelligence Service have come to the surface uh, over the course of, uh, of this last year. Um, as much as the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces wants people to believe that they are in complete control of the country, uh, every now and again you get a sense that in fact they are not and they have not been able to uh, move things in the direction they want, either by their own mistakes or because there is resistance, passive resistance, but certainly resistance to what they are doing by, on the part of other ministries and important organizations in the Egyptian government. Let's talk now about the evolution of the military's attitudes towards Islam and the Islamicists during uh, this period. When we think of Nasser, we think of a secularist, basically. But by the time we, we move to Sadat, he's actually reaching out uh, to the Islamicists, but, but trying to to keep them under uh, his control. Well, in fact, Sadat referred to himself as the believing president and was uh, very proud of uh, the mark on his head called the Zabiba, which reflects uh, in Egypt a devout Muslim who, when prostrates to pray, uh, really presses their, their forehead against, uh, against the ground. And it was sort of a, a source of pride for him and, and others. I, I, I would include Nasser, though, in saying that Egyptian leaders have tried to leverage religion for their own uh, for their own interests, um, certainly Nasser did it in certain different ways than Sadat, and Mubarak did it different uh, still. But they've all tried to manipulate religion for their own political ends, believing that they could control it in the end. Now, the armed forces itself. Um, uh, there is clearly a competition between the Muslim Brotherhood, Egypt's largest uh, social movement and political movement, uh, and, and, and the military. Um, but it's not because the military is necessarily staunchly secular, um, like uh, the Turkish armed forces, for example. Um, the military in Egypt uh, has said that it uh, tries to run the military in along with uh, Islamic principles. Um, so it, it's not a question of religion. I, I think that the officers, present-day Egyptian officers, really don't believe in anything. They don't have an ideological perspective. They're looking to make a deal with uh, whatever political group can guarantee a certain set of interests related to their economic interests and their place in the system, which is very important, that they remain uh, the sole source of power and legitimacy and authority in, in the political system. But Mubarak often used the Muslim Brotherhood in ways believing that he could always control it, and when they got out of hand, he repressed them. Sadat used them to denasserize uh, the system. Mubarak essentially outsourced uh, social uh, services uh, uh, to the Brotherhood. Most recently, uh, Mubarak's Ministry of Interior, in the, over the course of the last four or five years, uh, supported, uh, whether passively or actively, uh, Salafist groups, believing that the Salafist groups would draw support away from the Muslim Brotherhood and that the regime would always be there to control 
uh, the Salafists. Now, when we, when we talk about Islam in Egypt, we're, we're really talking about uh, uh, a font of, of intellectual thinking within Islam emerging out of Egypt on the one hand. So it's at, at, the, at, it's at the forefront, it seems, of intellectual uh, developments uh, in Islam that relate to how you deal with the modern world on the one hand. And in its aberration, it, it's actually influenced intellectually the, the pathologies that emerged uh, with terrorism. Well, it's true. That Egypt has always been a, a source, and more generally, not just religious learning but and religious knowledge, but uh, a source of uh, and a center of cultural production and knowledge and um, a center where great debates of, of Islamic reformism were had in the early 20th century. Uh, and Al-Azhar, the, 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 the mosque and university, is the oldest and previously the most influential institution of uh, Sunni Islamic learning in the world. Uh, and if you wanted to be a, a Sunni preacher, you would go to Al-Azhar uh, to be trained and to learn uh, there in Egypt, in Cairo. Um, but it is also true that um, Egypt has been a font of what we come to know as transnational jihadism. The intellectual roots for transnational jihadism were laid in Egypt in the 1960s. Uh, and Al-Qaeda uh, is widely regarded to be a, a Saudi organization uh, because of, the, uh, of Osama bin Laden. Um, but in fact, uh, it was very much an Egyptian organization. The number two, Ayman Zawahri, uh, implicated in the murder of Anwar Sadat, uh, and others who are uh, important figures in Al-Qaeda uh, hail from Egypt. Egypt has produced a veritable all-star list of uh, transnational terrorists. Now, at the same time, the, especially the Muslim Brotherhood uh, was really ahead of the game in political organizing, in providing social welfare. What, what are the roots of that? Are they in the religion, or does in part that emerge out of their relationship with the regime? Well. The Brotherhood had an 80-year head start on many of the political parties that were vying for uh, a seat in, in, in the People's Assembly. Uh, they have also engaged, in, for a long time, in the provision of social services for Egyptians in need, which was an effective mechanism of political mobilization. Uh, they also had, from time to time, the tolerance of a regime for its own reasons wanting to uh, uh, allow the, the Brotherhood to take a role in these things for the regime's own political purposes or the leaders of these regimes' political purposes. And I think just as important that the Muslim Brotherhood has a vision of Egyptian society mm -hmm. uh, that matters in, to uh, Egyptians, that means something to Egyptians, that a, a positive vision of the future uh, of Egyptian society. And the fact that it is delivered in a religious vernacular makes uh, it important, resonates deeply with the Egyptian people. And I think in, in relation to their main competitors, the military, on a variety of issues like nationalism and the economy and corruption, and they score better uh, than the military, at least from the perspective of a lot of Egyptians. So for all of those reasons, the Brotherhood, which has not handled the transition smoothly at all, but for all of those reasons, certainly had uh, a tremendous advantage over political parties that have carried over from the Mubarak period and the myriad of new political parties that emerged after the uprising. It, 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 we have here a situation where the military regime it, it, over the long haul never responded to the issues of equity, social justice, which were raised again in the, in the recent uh, uprising. Uh, and on the other hand, the Muslim Brotherhood, with its roots in Islam, was actually responding to uh, the failures of the system in some, in, in some important way. Well, in fact, the regimes, uh, whether it was under Nasser or Sadat or Mubarak, failed to live up to its principles and, and, and what it was telling the people about Egypt uh, didn't 
conform to the way in which Egyptians were experiencing their, their daily lives. And the Brotherhood has exploited that gap uh, to tell Egyptians another story about how Egypt could be under, uh, under the Brotherhood. Now, let's not be namby-pamby, though, about the Muslim Brotherhood. There are a lot of questions about the Brotherhood, and certainly their democratic credentials are not beyond reproach. Um, to my mind, they have never repudiated their ultimate goal of Islamizing Egyptian society from below and establishing an Islamic state with Sharia as its core, Islamic law as its core, and its particular interpretation of, uh, of Islamic law, which does not, does not conform to a kind of liberal democratic uh, political order that some hope will emerge uh, in post-Mubarak uh, Egypt. So I, I think that uh, there is a lot for us to see uh, going forward, whether they have, in fact, leveraged the language of change and reform and progressive politics for inherently anti-democratic ends, or whether the organization truly means it when they talk about political change and reform. Uh, when you read your book, uh, what, what pops up again and again is the students. So they are an important force that uh, emerges and then sort of subsides in, in its influence. So what, what is different now, if anything, with regard to the student movement uh, besides the technology? Obviously, the, the technology made an important difference in, in at least mobilizing for the moment, so to speak. Well, no doubt that the technology played an important role in the instigation and mobilizing an organization, but an interesting little factoid. Uh, when the Egyptian authorities brought down the Internet with the help of technology supplied by the U.S. government, uh, Egyptian uh, revolutionaries didn't have a means to, they weren't able to use Facebook or Twitter. So they went to another generation of student activists, the 1968 generation of student activists, and said, how did you organize? How did you build momentum without having the tools that we, we now have uh, and seeking uh, it, counsel from from this older generation of, of students who were mobilized and uh, opposed to uh, the regime that the free officers built starting in the 1950s. But I think the themes are very similar. Uh, in the aftermath of the uprising in February 1968, the pressure from the students being in the streets forced Nasser to uh, issue the March 30 program. Uh, which was uh, the most important, which was a, a ten-point program that promised a more democratic and representative government. He obviously he never carried through. Now, what I think is different now is in part these enabling technologies and the unwillingness of these younger group of people to continue to be intimidated by the regime and it, it represented now by the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. The, the revolutionary groups have made a ton of mistakes. Uh, since last February, but they have been right in that, one, the revolution was unfinished and that the military was not, in fact, supporting the legitimate demands of the Egyptian people, as the military claimed, but, in fact, a counter-revolutionary force. In the end, what this all boils down to, it seems, is the failure of all of these military regimes. Uh, and leaders like Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak to deal uh, with the economy and to deal with it in a way that didn't just benefit a small group, but rather the, the whole society. And so now we're co they, the Egyptians are confronted with a, an economy that's become an even greater uh, basket case. Uh, how does that feed into the, the emerging power of the different actors? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm, I'm perhaps not as Marxist as you on this. Um, I don't think it was all about the economy. I think ideas have mattered. I think that Egyptians have been searching for social justice, more representative government, and their place in the world. Uh, and of course, social justice is in part related to uh, economic and educational opportunities. And I think that uh, that carries through to today. Now, the collapsing Egyptian economy and the, the uh, problems that people encountered prior to the uprising certainly contributed to an environment that made this uprising uh, possible. Um, but first and foremost, I think it was an uprising about dignity and more representative government and democracy and, and those kinds of things, uh, more than it was just about the economy. But again, uh, 
now that Egyptians are confronted with uh, a collapsing economy, I think the concern has to be that um, uh, Egyptians will seek someone who can make the trains run on time, someone who promises uh, rapid economic change uh, rather than representative government in a, in a more open uh, political system. But one of the battles that is going to be uh, fought in, in, in the future in Egypt in the coming months is going to be over economic policymaking. And I think everybody agrees that the economy is collapsing, but what to do about it, whether to carry through with the kind of liberal economic reforms that Mubarak pursued over his cor the course of his last decade in power, or to roll that back uh, and reinvest in the social contract, uh, reinvest in subsidies, uh, halt privatization, perhaps even roll back privatization, are things that Egyptians are going to debate going forward. And, and help us understand the contours of the economy. You, you really have a youth bulge there and high unemployment among youth, 25 percent or so. Uh, and, and what percentage of the population are uh, people under 30? Uh, a huge number, huge yeah. number, tremendous youth bulge. Uh, I think the thing to, the, the, the three things to keep in mind about the Egyptian economy besides the huge uh, youth bulge is that the Egyptian economy is dependent on three sources uh, of revenue. Suez Canal tolls, which are down because of the global economic downturn. Tourism, which is down because of the uh, unrest and instability and uncertainty in Egypt right now. And remittances coming from uh, Egyptian workers living in the Gulf or other parts of the world, which have not come in uh, as quickly and at the same pace that they had previously because even those workers in other places are concerned about all of the uncertainty in Egypt. And right now there doesn't seem to be changes to any of those three things uh, on the horizon. So Egyptians are um, going to suffer. There is Egypt has some gas, um, some of which it exports to Jordan and Israel. The, the exports to Israel are very controversial, but uh, otherwise uh, it is not uh, an economic powerhouse in terms of, in terms of trade. Uh, you have a section in your book about the flawed assumptions of U.S. foreign policy for the uh, last 30 years. Talk about that. What, what, what has been right about what are, the U.S. has been doing vis-a-vis -vis Egypt and, and what has been wrong and, and what are we paying uh, for now? Well, 30 or so years ago, the United States struck a strategic uh, relationship with Egypt for very good reasons. Uh, Egypt being the most powerful, most influential Arab state could be a bulwark against uh, Soviet uh, penetration in the Middle East. Uh, Egypt at peace with Israel would bring an end to the prospect of uh, regional war. And Egypt, as an ally of the United States, would help make sure that no other country other than the United States dominated uh, dominated the Middle East, which would help the free flow of oil out of the region. And all of these things were good assumptions, but 30 years later, they didn't make as much sense as uh, they did when that strategic relationship uh, began. And uh, yet we continue to operate as if that world still existed. The other, I think, flaw was uh, how deeply involved we were in Egypt. We didn't recognize Egypt's history. In, in some way, we were naive in a, in a way. We were going to help build, with this new relationship, we were going to help build a new Egypt. And we did wonderful things uh, in terms of Egyptian infrastructure, electrification, making potable water, water available for people through our the U.S. Agency for International Development, wonderful agricultural programs, health programs. I mean, you could go on and on and on and on. Um, but it was also coming on the heels of uh, a, a, another period of Egyptian empowerment where uh, Egyptians weren't so fond of the idea of foreign domination. Now, of course, what we were doing in Egypt wasn't domination, but it was an occupation. But uh, again, uh, this was something that was unsettling uh, to many Egyptians. And then, of course, the strategic alignment with the United States and the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, which is a factor in the U.S.-Egypt relationship, was seen as rendering Egypt a secondary or second-rate power in the region. Egypt was sidelined while the United States and Israel pursued their interests unfettered in the region, and this made Egyptians feel, uh, feel quite weak. So um, this is something that we didn't appreciate. 
we didn't appreciate that Egyptians didn't look at the treaty between Egypt and Israel in the same way that many people in other parts of the world did. They didn't see Sadat as heroic. They saw him as perhaps reckless, as someone who uh, the Israelis got the better of him in, in the negotiations, and that it was a shameful piece because it was a separate piece. Now, that's hard to accept from the Western narrative of this great, you know, achievement of Egypt-Israel peace, but there is a genuine feeling that it warped Egyptian uh, foreign policy to the benefit of both the United States and Israel. So how does the United States respond now in this transition, apparently, to a democratic uh, Egypt? First question, did, did the Obama administration handle things well during the, the uprising? Well, about as well as anybody could expect. This is a great Washington, D.C. parlor game question, you know. How would you grade the Obama administration's handling of the, uh, of the uprisings in the Arab world, but in particular in Egypt? Uh, my answer is, this is hard. There's no precedent. There's no playbook. Uh, they did as best as they possibly uh, could do. I will tell you that from the very beginning, there was a sense that this was different from other protests and that uh, the people were going for broke and trying to bring down, uh, bring down Mubarak. And there was really not much that the United States could do if that was truly the dynamic uh, that was underway. In terms of what we should be doing now, my, my advice, if anybody were to ever ask it, is that uh, less is actually more. Um, that we should be mindful of our history in Egypt, or we should be mindful of the perception of our history in Egypt, which is supporting a military-dominated dictatorship that repressed its people and was brutal uh, in, in the process. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, the United States should stick to first principles about democracy, democracy and tolerance and nonviolence and accountability and checks and balances and equal application of the law and wait for Egyptians to ask us for something that, and do our very best to respond to those requests. We don't want to be seen as trying to manage or influence or shape the Egyptian political process. This is a moment where Egyptians feel empowered, where they want to write their own history. And, and quite frankly, we don't have the best, uh, we don't have the best street cred in, in Egypt these days. Um, unfortunately, the policy process doesn't necessarily allow for that uh, because our own bureaucracies fight for their resources, and when they have those resources, they have to do something with them in order to justify their existence in the following year's budget. Uh, my hope is, though, that um, even with that, people are mindful of our, our history in Egypt and that uh, we defer to Egyptians when it comes to uh, helping them build the new Egypt. There's a dilemma here for a policymaker in Washington in the sense that uh, we are advocates of democracy, but the winner, and at least in the short term, of uh, the democratization are the groups that, that we are, uh, uh, we view negatively because of uh, their uh, alleged link with terrorism. It's not a strong link, but, but I'm really talking talking about the debate here in the United States. So, uh, and our efforts to bring democratization there through uh, Republican or Democratic institutes, as we're discovering, is perceived as foreign meddling. So it's, it's a very hard problem to get your hands on. We want to further democracy, but the winners in uh, uh, nascent democratic movements may be uh, people we, we see as working against our interests. Well, first, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the big winner in the most in the Egyptian elections, doesn't really have a link to uh, to terrorism. But I, I think, wasn't saying no, that. No, I understand I, yeah, that. It's the, I the, the, the debate, the yeah. perception that yeah. people have put yeah. out, particularly in this presidential election season, and it's just not true. Uh, I do think, though, that the dilemmas that we confront here are a function of the fact that for decades we relied on non-democratic leaders to carry our water in the region to help us pursue our interests. Now, that worked very well. We were pretty successful, but when those regimes come to an end, we're confronted with these dilemmas. And the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, and others um, have sought, have been steadfast in their opposition to Egypt's strategic relationship with the United States and will 
quite naturally seek to cap capitalize on this politically, which is a reason why uh, things are going to be more complicated for the United States uh, in the region. Um, uh, and, and one of the reasons why the United States, I think, in terms of our policy, less is more. Um, there's really very little that we can do about this. Um, the Egyptian people, to the extent that 52 to 60 percent of them voted, voted overwhelmingly for either the Freedom and Justice Party, which is the party of the Muslim Brotherhood, or uh, the Salafist and Nord Party. Uh, there's uh, very little that we have at our disposal to shape the political arena in Egypt. And as a result, I think it's incumbent upon policymakers to adjust to a new reality, not to try to force some new reality on Egypt or reverse things. Uh, we don't need another operation or uh, a, a, another operation something Egyptian. No, no I mean, uh, something freedom. We don't need an operation Egyptian freedom. Not that anybody is seriously talking about that. But I, I, my point is just that our ability to drive events and shape the events in this part of the world is actually rather limited, and so that we need to recognize the reality for what it is and adjust our, uh, our, our approach to these countries accordingly. Uh, as you look to the future, uh, what, what do you see issues that, that we should be concerned about as the Egyptian people make their own history and, and uh, 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 define the outcome of what you call the struggle for Egypt? Well, I think there's, I think there's three things. Um, one is the handover of power from the military to civilians, which is supposed to happen in June, July of 2012. We'll see how that goes. We'll tell us something about the trajectory of Egyptian politics. And then two other things which are related, which is the constitution writing process, which is supposed to begin relatively soon and take place over the course of six months. Um, how that unfolds and, importantly, how Egyptians try to answer those important questions about their identity, about what kind of government they want, what kind of society they want, what the relationship is between a citizen and, and their state, Egypt's place in the world, what it stands for, in that process. Those are the most important antecedent questions. The quality of elections won't matter, or whether they hold elections or not, until Egyptians agree on the answers to those questions and, and some others. And I think that those three things, although two are related, are really markers for observers to get a sense of the direction uh, that Egypt is moving. What, what do you think outside actors should do with regard to the Egyptian economy? Because during this period, the, it, it seems to be critical for uh, the success, you know, of whatever group within Egypt winds up uh, uh, ruling in an Egyptian democracy? Well, to the extent that anybody has any money left, I think that they should continue to invest in Egypt. The United States is the largest investor in Egypt, although it's not a huge amount. Uh, the, the Turks have been very active uh, throughout the region and are looking to in, uh, for opportunities uh, in Egypt. And then uh, Americans should go to Egypt. Uh, it's, it's, you would think from the news reports that this was, Cairo in particular was a city at war with itself. Um, it's not the case. Uh, and one of the great things that people can do to help Egypt is to go and enjoy Egypt and the amazing sites. Egypt is the inheritor, modern day Egyptians are the inheritors of a great civilization. There's still the pyramids of Giza, the Steppe Pyramid of Sa'ara, the Valley of the Kings, Karnak, Abu Simbel. These things are all there uh, waiting to be discovered by Egyptian, uh, by uh, tourists who can spend their money in Egypt and, and help. Uh, there are a lot of Egyptians who've been thrown out of work because there aren't the millions and millions of tourists visiting the country as a result of the uprising and the subsequent instability and uncertainty. Uh, now, looking back at the origins of your book, you, you, you chose to go back and do a political history, and then uh, history delivered <laughs> uh, interesting phenomena at the same time. What, 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 from your journey, do you learn about uh, answering this question, which is, how would you like what you found in this book have an impact on on policy uh, in, in the sense, are, are the insights that you drew that, that, that you think would be helpful for the American dialogue on this? Well, you know, all too often in Washington, these policy debates are, happen in a historical vacuum. And uh, what 
I would very much like to come out of the struggle for Egypt is for the ability of people when they have these debates to place them in the proper historical perspective. And that if we did have, if we did have a longer view of Egyptian politics and paid more attention to what Egypt's re Egyptians were saying and what they wanted, we may have a, a, a better policy. Um, you can only have, your policy is only as good as your assumptions are, and your assumptions should be informed by a, a rigorous history and a, a correct reading of, of the country. And I think all too often uh, these conversations happen and we're shooting from the hip. Uh, last spring I was privy to a conversation, uh, mostly of outside experts, in which uh, the kind of dominant theme was, we have to get Egypt right. How is Egypt ours to get right? It's almost as if Egyptians have no agency, no ability to calculate their own interests, that somehow they need our help. Well, if the uprising should teach us anything, they certainly don't need our help. They have the means uh, within themselves to change uh, the course of their own history, and they should be able to do that without our interference, only when they ask for it. That's what I'd like people to get out of it. Well, Stephen, on that note, uh, let me show your book again, uh, The Struggle for Egypt, uh, a, a, a good book and an important read uh, at this critical time in Egypt's uh, history. Uh, thank you again for being with us. Thank you very much, Harry. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.